All right, you guys, I want to welcome you all in to our conversation today. And because we don't have a lot of people, I think we're going to be able to give some space for you to really ask some questions. Um, I'm Tiffany Gibson. I'm the director of the Equity and Quality Initiatives team for the California After School Network. I am here supporting my friend and colleague and as you heard me say before, kind of co-conspirator in all of this work, Dr. Rebecca Mendiola, who has made um, what I think a really unique journey into the work that she's holding now. So she's doing some amazing system building and collective impact work with her organization and nonprofit called Collective Impact Solutions. Before that, she can tell you a little bit about her journey, but she started in Santa Clara. She was in San Diego. Um, she's a counselor, she's done social services, she's done all of the things. So Dr. Mediola, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Um, wow, Tiffany knows a lot about me. Uh, and, and we've, we've been uh, together for probably now almost, what, four years now? Four years, four or five years? Um, so Rebecca Mediola, I am the CEO with Collective Impact Solutions, as Tiffany had mentioned, um, have a long history of uh, career in education. Um, like she said, I was a mental health therapist working in special education, social worker, um, worked at a school site level, district level um, in Guam, and now in, in California. I've been here about maybe over 20 years, since 2002. And um, gosh, worked with Ravenswood City School District in East Palo Alto, if you guys are familiar with them, uh, then moved into a coordinator position with the Santa Clara County Office of Education, um, then moved up into creating a department called the Safe and Healthy Schools at the County Office of Ed to really support the work around PBIS. And I was one of the co-founders of the PBIS Coalition and MTSS across the state. Um, and then went to San Diego County Office of Ed to be the assistant superintendent of uh, student services. So I was there about two years and did a lot of kind of work trying to figure out how to connect the dots. And throughout my journey, as Tiffany said, it really has been um, being a mental health therapist and a social worker, my kind of hard and my charge has been to support students with emotional disabilities and their families. And a lot of times what we notice and we recognize is those are our students that don't get a whole lot of support and services, but need have the highest level of need. And so my journey has really been um, trying to help folks see the connection and really in, integrate and um, really begin to collaborate and and be a collective in supporting our families, our communities, and our students with the highest needs. Uh, it's really been kind of the work that I've been doing. And as Tiffany mentioned, we are now, and she's a part of this journey with us, working with uh, Santa Clara County, the entire county, uh, all the agencies, um, including the, the County Office of Education, the Board of Supervisors, and the leaders really beginning to think about how do we align our services and our supports to begin to dismantle the intergenerational psycho disadvantaged populations. Uh, so that also includes school districts. So my heart will forever be with education and I'm really grateful for Tiffany to ask me to be a part of this kind of workshop with all of you to begin thinking about um, how do we connect the dots and we're gonna kind of talk about that today. And like she said, we're a small enough group to ask questions and just have a dialogue. Uh, so I won't be talking too much at you, but I will be kind of going through the concepts and so forth. Um, so with that, this beautiful face saying, look who's here. We wanna just kind of get a feel for who you are. Um, and I think many of you guys actually put it in the chat box already. and. I'd like to just kind of see some of your faces if you can, um, but also just kind of chime in and tell me who you are, where you're from, and what your positions are. 
So um, anyone can start, then we'll just pass it on to the next. My name is Lori Guy. I'm from Marysville Joint Unified School District. I'm currently an elementary school principal, but in July, I'll be moving into a director of data and student improvement. And we have a um, coordinator that's in charge of our after school programs in the ELOP, but I'll be working with that person. So I'm just trying to see how I can best support them in their work. Well, congratulations. Thank All right. Um, so who'd like to go next? I'm gonna just call on you. How about Sharon? Good morning, I'm from San Mateo County Office and I'm a coordinator for district improvement and support. And I'm also a new MTSS coach. So we're going through the um, cohort three. Yay, so you'll chime in and uh, help us out in this presentation too. Awesome. All right, well, welcome Sharon. Carla. My name is Carla Estrada Hidalgo and I am the ELD and Title I coordinator for our school district in Livermore, California. Um, I am um, excited about this because uh, next school year, we're gonna have all of our schools participate in um, MTSS um, work. We've already started with PBIS uh, and, and other, other components, but we're using, we're part of the Orange County um, Office of Education um, a grant that was rolled out. So all of our schools in our district and I will be one of the coaches trying to coach school school site principals. So I'm going through the training myself. So I'm excited to hear what um, about how I can incorporate um, this into the after school program because I also oversee the after school program in our district. So thank Wonderful, you. Carla. And I was probably one of the, the first people coming into your district for PBIS. So Awesome, I'm glad to see that it's actually continuing. Um, Martha. Good morning, everybody. I'm Martha, I'm the after school coordinator here for Oakland Unified School District. Um, I'm just, you know, we have a pretty strong MTSS system, and I just want to see how we can incorporate best practices in our after school program and be more intentional. Wonderful, lots of experts in the room. So I excited about that. Akila. Good morning, everyone. I'm Akila Bird. I'm here from the Alameda County Office of Education. Joining today, like many others, and shout out to Region 4. I see some folks in the room. Carla, Martha, Sharon. Um, yes, so just really trying to see how to help the rollout of MTSS. I'm in a social emotional learning department. We definitely have people being trained for coaches here. I have a background in MTSS being a prior site administrator myself, but to really think about how to expand that to expanded learning um, programs so that we can really meet the needs of serving the whole child. All right. Uh, welcome, Akila and Manpreet. Hi, I'm Manpreet with Sacramento City Unified School District. I'm the um, Director of Youth Development. We do many programs, including expanded learning programs. And uh, MTSS work started um, with some changes um, like four years ago. And uh, now I'm here just to see how we can include that work in our expanded learning programs with ELOP funding. We have 68 programs in our school district um, under AC's 21st century and ELOP. Wonderful. Thank you for being here, Brisa. Hi, good morning, Brisa Huerta Price. I'm with Calexico Unified School District. I'm the director of Seeing Federal Projects and the former coordinator for expanded learning. So this, my peeps are here. <laughs> um, and today I'm just trying to see um, how to speak, how to speak um, admin <laughs> to get buy-in from all these other, you know, from the district, from the sites that this is, this is not just after school. This is how we serve our students, you know, our English learners, socioeconomically disadvantaged or migrant population. And so I'm just, just getting more ideas. Well, Brisa, I don't know if I'll be able to give you that in this hour and a half. <laughs> I've been an admin for years, but uh, we definitely will support you in trying to get you that language to support you in alignment. All right, Virginia, welcome. 
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Virginia Castro. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Ed Services for El Monte City School District. Um, I agree with some of the comments on the chat. I'm here to figure out a way to intertwine um, MTSS to the rollout of our um, ELOP grant. So we're in the process of hiring a coordinator. We've done a lot um, to put it in place, but just uh, making sure that our programs are in alignment with the work that we're already doing district-wide. All right, wonderful. Welcome, Virginia and Petra. Hello, uh, I'm just here as an accountant, just, just learning stuff. Not anything specific, just about programs. I love that you're an accountant and you're in this space. Thank you for coming, Petra, because that's important. Many folks need to understand the work. And as we continue to grow, I think what I'm going to ask the rest of the folks is to just put your name in the chat and go ahead and put your organization and your position. We'll get to talking and get to learn uh, more about who you all are. Uh, but again, if you have questions as we go forward with the presentation, please go ahead and put it in the chat box and we'll try to answer as, as much as we can. But it sounds like, and Tiff, um, please add, but it sounds like all of you are really trying to see how to align, right? There's a lot of different plans, a lot of different work that are being asked of every single one of you. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm not gonna go into the entire framework around MTSS, but I am gonna give you components and I am going to give you kind of the, the specific things that I really believe are at least the first steps of really getting you to a place of understanding around how do we integrate and align the systems, all right? Is that fair enough? All right, so as I mentioned, our main focus, uh, California has really embraced MTSS. It sounds like many of you guys are going through this cohort of training and becoming coaches, which is really, really um, exciting for me, especially being one of the first to really start this work uh, years and years ago. So I'm really excited to really see that and then also see how it's really becoming a part of the work around expanded learning as well. Sometimes when we talk about MTSS and throw these acronyms out, that's all it is. But many of you have just shared that you are really trying to get to a place of speaking that language of how do we get our leaders to connect the dots and really have an understanding of, of expanded learning. I always say that there's a disconnect between K-12 and expanded learning. How many of you guys feel that that's that's where it is, right? <laughs> years and years and years as an assistant superintendent, as a director, there was always a place for me to say, well, what are the resources that we're trying to get to uh, our students, even in the after school world? How do we connect the dots? So being able to do that at a district level and then really pushing districts to really think outside the box and begin to connect has been something that has been uh, really one of the charges that I've really tried to embrace over the years. So I'm going to talk to you a lot. Many of you guys are going to chime in as well because you guys have been a part of this kind of journey with MTSS, those co core components, and actually moving in the direction of looking at MTSS as a framework. So when we think about all the different plans and all the different funding sources, especially all this additional money coming in, how are we aligning and what are we doing to ensure that we're meeting the needs of the whole child and not continuing to do the work in silos? So well, is that good with all of you? Kind of that conversation we're gonna have today, wonderful. All right, so I worked on this slide and I had a conversation, Tiffany knows I love doing these slides. If you guys need like a website to go to with all these different PowerPoints, let me know. Um, but this slide is very important. And it's very important because I think it showcases all the plans every district has to put in place. And I'm just going to ask you, any one of you, how many of you all have been connecting every single plan, not to say that nobody's done it, because I know there's many districts that are strategically trying to get this done. But how many of you guys have actually been doing this work intentionally and connecting all actually, the plans? Go ahead, yeah. Sharon. Oh, 
I was just going to say we're trying. <laughs> we actually have a pandemonium Monday um, for our county office, so they can come in and talk about the different ones, and we're always um, connecting the different ones, whether we're having CSI, DA, or LCAP meetings, kind of making sure that we're all trying to connect them together. Okay, wonderful. So there's a lot of work that's already happening in the system in regards to how are we connecting the dots. Um, so as you can see here, you have LCFF with LCAP, not just the plan itself, but in, in also you have CSI and ATSI, uh, you have the SIPSA plans, you have the comprehensive school safety plans, every district and school site needs to put that together. Um, if you are identified as having to do a California coordinated early intervening services plan is another plan that our special ed department has to do. And then even just within expanded learning, you have your ACES, you have your 21st century. If you're identified for targeted intervention, you're, you have that, um, what is it, uh, TA, right? Um, what is it called? Uh, where they identify, anyways, you guys know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yes, so there's that, okay. yes, there's that that specific plan you had to put in place and, and work with your site leads on that. Then there's the new funding coming down the pipe. You have ESSER 1, 2, and 3. You have the universal pre-K, educator effectiveness. Then you have the ELO, Expanded Learning Grant Opportunity Grant. And then in addition to that, the ELO program. So that's a lot of plans that you all have to do. I've been working with some of the school districts in Santa Clara County and that just having assistant superintendents and directors sitting at the table, they just look overwhelmed. And it really depends on even if you have a large school district and or if you have a small school district, there are some school districts that have to write the entire thing, all, every single one of these plans. So how do we begin to help kind of build out a framework for them in doing this work? All right, just wanted to show you that. So how many of you guys have seen this slide? Many of you guys, if you've been a part of MTSS, you probably have seen this slide over and over and over again. So talk to me about it. Tell me more about what you see in this slide, what you thought about it, what you think about it. Is this our reality? Yes. <laughs> I see it and too. it goes back to the plans on the other slide. like. Luckily, many of those come through my office, so I do have a say and I get a lot, I can sit back and see the larger picture, but those that I'm not, I, I make sure that I'm in there because then it helps build like the LCAP, LCFF, that should be your guiding document for the whole district. So if I'm part of that, it helps me with the supplemental funding and then help the principals with their SPSAs and then just making sure that everything's aligned. But if we're working in silos, then we're only focused like on the tail and the tail, oh, it's a snake, it's, you know, or it's a rope. And so it's, we're very um, limited to what we see. We're right, but we have to kind of step back and take a look at the bigger picture. Take a look at the bigger picture. Anyone else? Well, somebody want to read the, the little blurb on the top for me? By the very nature of systems, each of us only sees a part of the system. The problem is the part we see is very compelling. And what I wanted to add is when I look at this um, picture is it's also being very reactive versus being proactive and having that collaboration in advance, but just reacting <laughs> when the things come out or when it's, it's due and things of that nature. That's exactly it, right, Akila? And it's it's reactive, but it's also my tail is important. And that's really important, guys. <laughs> Maybe not your ear. The ear is not as important as my tail, right? But that's where we are. That's where we get to when we, we talk about system. And it's not just in the education system. Tiffany and I have been doing work across a larger system and it's the same. Behavioral health is more important than probation, right? Not to say that our kids are not more important. Here's the thing. Brisa mentioned that she is being, she places herself in all these different areas so that she can kind of see the larger picture and see the connection. But what happens when Brisa leaves? What happens when Brisa leaves? Brisa, are you gonna to continue to come back to the school district? 
Yes, and I was gonna, I was putting in the chat. What? I'm married to the Fed director. <laughs> um, married but, to the Fed director. That's funny. It's a concern because if I were ever to leave, or you know, who's gonna who's gonna know, and who's gonna have? You don't know if they're gonna have the same approach of a more of a systems wide approach than a just just these things that come through my office. That's right. It can't just be a Brisa approach. It can't just be a Sharon approach. And it can't just be an Aquila approach. It has to be a system-wide approach. So what does that mean, right? And, and Brisa talked about it a little bit. What's the administrative talk that we can get our leaders to a place of understanding that there needs to be a framework that ties this all together? So when you're thinking about this work, y'all, you think about this elephant and you say, yes, Every single part of the elephant is important because that what is what makes up the elephant, but one is not more important than the other. We have to leverage all of it. We have to think about what does it all look like and how does it all play out? All right. Okay, the same old thinking, the same old results. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not to say, I mean, you know, expanded learning has been leading the way on com uh, compassionate systems and they always talk about kind of that creative tension, right? And the creative tension really is about that vision that we're trying to get to, doing something new, but people wanting, going, wanting to go back to that current reality. So that's hard. There's always this gap in between that we're trying to struggle to get to that vision, but people are going to push back and go back to that current reality and which is those sides, right? So let's continue and let's move forward. All right, so thinking about systems, let's think about how all the parts are connected. Anybody know about this toy? Do you have it at home? This little tinker toy? Some of you have kids or remember it way back when? So what happens with this toy? You see the little knobs, the little circles on the end? What, what happens when you, turn, when you turn those knobs? It all kind of goes together, right? What happens with one, when one knob is gone? When one, I'm sorry, one little tool thing is gone? Anybody? It doesn't work. It doesn't work right? So when we're thinking about our students and we're thinking about our families, we want to make sure that all the different pieces, every part of the elephant has to move in sync. We have to move together because it, we're not doing the world right now. We're doing the work all in silo, but how do we really get to that whole child and how do we support our students in a more effective and efficient way? All right. So defining a system an inter inter interdependent group of tools and materials, people and processes, which join together to accomplish work. What do y'all think? Yeah, it's what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to achieve. It can't just be an Aquila doing all the work and connecting all the dots. It has to be an interdependent group of tools, materials, people, and processes working together, okay? So that is the definition of a system. So how about this picture? And do you all know who George Botch is? He's kind of the guru of RTI, okay? So what he says is, a system that produces the same protocols, protocols over a three-year period of time has demonstrated that its way of work is organized and efficient in producing those outcomes consistently. What does that mean to all of you? And how does that relate to the work you, you're currently doing? The system that's built within your organization. We can't be changing constantly. We need, we need to give it time to work and produce some results. And I know in, in education, we're like, ooh, the next best thing. Ooh, something else came up. Ooh, new approach. Uh, ooh, new PD. So yeah, food for that. So we have to allow for something to, to work before we change things up. Okay. Anybody else?
So what Dr. George Botch says is that if we have a system that we've created, it's going to continue um, to produce the same outcomes over and over and over again, right? We got to begin to shift the way we do the, the work that we do and the system that we actually put in place. That will then allow us to then change and produce different outcomes, okay? All right. So Kaiser Permanente. When we talk about systems, we always put up this picture of Kaiser Permanente. Why do you guys think we put this picture up? Any of you have Kaiser? Yeah, some of you are like, I don't like Kaiser. But those of you who do like Kaiser, <laughs> why do you like Kaiser? Tell me your experience around Kaiser. Why do you think we have this picture up? Well, Kaiser makes you go through systems and protocols to get to the next level, even though it's redundant or ridiculous. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's over and over again. So you pick up the phone, you make the phone call, and they, it's very systematic. It's very systematic. Carla, do you want to say something? It's member centered, meaning that this graphic uh, gives you the impression that um, we are number one, we are the central focus. Um, and, uh, you know, then there's a system that helps us to improve whatever elements we might have. That's right. And it, you said it right there and then it's member focused, right? Just like we're trying to move towards all our students are students focused. Our system is students focused. So when you walk into Kaiser, you already know that once you walk in, check in, they have your name on there. Then from when you check in, the nurse on the other end is going to call you, call you back to the back room. Your doctor is going to know everything about you because you just did your, you just went and did your blood work. He has all that information. So the system that they've created has allowed for the member to really do one thing, and then they all then connect with one another. It's a collective, it's collaborative, right? They don't need to go, I mean, sometimes they probably had to pick up the phone to talk to one another, but all they had to do is look in their system, right? When I turn around and say, I had a surgery 10 years ago, all the doctor has to do is look in the system because all the, all the records and all the, the information is there. And then she just follows up some of the things that I forgot that I did. She'll bring up and say, oh, you had this, this, this date. Oh, was that the date that I did that? Okay, I didn't, I don't remember. That was a long ago. So that, that is what Kaiser has created. Tiff, did you want to say something? Yeah, because I want to add, and part of what we want people to see with, with this Kaiser example is, think about Kaiser 10, 15 years ago and think about Kaiser now, mm -hmm. right? And I'm looking at some of the things that um, that Janet was saying, right? It's that now the focus is supposed to be that it's member centered. If you they've kind of reimagined and like co-located services in one space so that you don't necessarily have to go from one place to another place to get lab work done or to get test results from here, right? And so because one of the things that they said in the restructuring and redesign was that that co-location of services and ensuring that each part of their system talked to the other was a critical shift in the member experience, right? Because now they were saying that someone that had a series of, of things they needed to do before they went to see their doctor took place at lots of different places. So that meant that people were having to drive and if they weren't feeling well, right? Like it was adding to the member's experience and not in a good way. So a lot of the things that they tried to look at shifting was so that the member's full experience could be different, right? And so when, when we ta started talking about systems, we always kind of looked at, that was a really significant change because if you look, they had to then shift um, their physical location. So buildings were redesigned, right? That um, the, the actual care system, like when you go into a meeting space with your doctor, they literally now may have an iPad or something in front of them and they pull up years worth of data on you to kind of help you reflect back through your experience of your own healthcare, right? When we started thinking about that, 
And we said, and now suppose if schools really did that and they put the experience of young people and the staff that has to live and love and work with them in the center of what we design, what would that actually look like? Thanks, Jeff. Um, and so the hope is, right, that we can get to a place of really transforming schools, right, as the superintendent is asking us to do. But what does that mean and how do we do it? It's okay to put, it, put this on the wheel in regards to all the different work that we're focusing on. But at the end of the day, what does that look like and how do we do that? And many times we are left to actually do that on our own, in our own district. But again, going back to how do we move away from the one hero to really putting some systems in place? Okay. Uh, Tiff, did you want to add to this one? No, and I, I think I just want us to hold, right? Uh, a lot of times when we start talking about system building work, it's not that we're discounting the individuals that have made a dysfunctional system work. We're not, <laughs> but what we're saying is all of that responsibility should not be on the individuals to make something that doesn't quite work, work. It means that we need to relook at our structures, our policies, our practices, so that any individual that comes into them can hold work. It doesn't have to be Brisa never retiring because if she does, <laughs> things won't happen, right? So yeah, that, that's it. Well, and think about that. If you look at this, Will, transforming schools, these are all very important elements that we need to have in place for our, our kids to be successful, right? That's, that's a given, yes. Um, what are the different components of each of these different areas that we need to align and that we need to continue to, to take a look at? So going back to that one slide that I have, that I built out in regards to all the different plans that are being asked of, of these different districts and our, our school sites, right? Every single one of these have different components to what is being asked of them as far as the plan. So what we also did was we created kind of a document of the different grants that are coming out or the new funding that is actually being asked of many of the, or of all of you guys, of all the different districts. And what I did was I, um, we have the funding streams on one side, which is the ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3, the ELO grant, ELO program, the UPK and the educator effectiveness. I'll give you this document because I have, I also have links to each of these different ones. And what, what I did was I asked one of my colleagues um, and consultants to actually write out these different focus areas so that it's all kind of in one, er one place for all of you. And really thinking about what are the specific areas that each of these funding sources actually take a look at. And I want us to kind of sit here and look through it and let's just have a dialogue around it because what I did was I highlighted some of the areas that actually are redundant in all the different funding sources, okay? So if you look at the ESSER 1, I know that was in back in 2022, that was, um, or I mean, the, the plan is to be implemented. So planning and implementing activities related to summer learning, supplemental after-school programs, addressing the needs of low-income students, students with disabilities, English learners, migrant students, students experiencing homeless, and children in foster care. And you go down and you look at the yellow grant, mental health services, access to meals, programs to address trauma, um, engagement of pupils and families, social emotional health, right? And then you go down to educator effectiveness as well as pre-K. There's a lot of kind of redundancies in regards to how do we begin to leverage these different resources. And I wanted to put this up here because this is kind of the starting place. This is a kind of the where you're going to hold in regards to helping people see the connection. So Brisa, going back to that conversation or that, that, that uh, question of how do we begin to have conversations with the leaders in regards to connecting the dots and alignment, right? One of the things that comes up for many of the schools that are either basic aid or even our small schools, they'll say to us, 
I don't, that's not enough money. I don't have, that's, a, that's not a whole lot of money. I'm just going to return the money. It's easier to return the money to then to do the plan, right? But then I like to tell the districts, let's sit, let's sit with this. Even if it's $100,000 that you're receiving, what can we leverage and what can we do to be able to support our students with this money? Because then we can connect this money to other resources that you might be getting. So any thoughts on this? Any of you guys, it sounds like some of you guys have been doing this already. Um, so any thoughts around what you have been doing and how you've been connecting the dots between the two? And just for folks that may like this may be a little hard to read, if you go to your view options at the top of the screen, you can increase the percentage and make it bigger. And then Rebecca's going to open this doc for me. And then I'm also going to put it in the chat so that when you all have some conversations later, you can see it. I mean, Hi, everybody. So this is Martha. I can share um, one of the challenges here in OUSD. Um, so the funding was great. I think part of the challenges that we struggled with is where the funding landed and where and who managed the funding, right? And so for ESSERS, the money went to the school sites and the school sites had no idea what to do with this money. And so even though it was in their budgets and they, they had access to it, they didn't know how to spend it. They didn't know what the rules were. They weren't familiar with um, expanded learning in that capacity. And so, especially for the ELO grant, a lot of those resources didn't get spent. You know, Michael Funk talked about the fear of like, what are the rules before I spend it? Our teachers and our principals had those same fears. So um, in a way it worked for our benefit because when ELO program came, the district was like, well, these our principals don't know what to do with this money. So here you take all of your ELO program and you know how to spend it. And I said, yes, I do. But uh, <laughs> um, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges is we, our office doesn't manage all of these programs or all of these funds. So it's hard to make those connections, um, especially here in Oakland, we're such a huge district. And so it, it's having multiple meetings with multiple departments and every department has a very different view and, or idea. Um, so yeah, that's just been part of one of the many challenges that we've had with all this additional funding. And Martha, you're not alone. Even just as a large school district, there are many districts that are so small that still are in that place, right? Um, I wanna key in on the fear of the rules. Those are things that continue to come up. And many times there's assumptions in regards to what people are reading that they're not clear in regards to what exactly the rule is. And I, I'll tell you right now, one of the districts that I've worked with keep pushing back on me and saying, it's the hours, it's the hours, it's the hours. It's like, you have the hours. Why is that so scary for you? And all we did was we called up one of our state reps and we said, hey, can you get clarify this? And they're like, oh, we, we were reading that wrong because that was how we interpreted it for, the, for years on end. So it's really important that we do get clarity, right? And who are those folks that you're getting clarity from? Anybody else want to share? I have a question, if I could. Yeah. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I've had the most difficulty getting into this site this morning. So I missed the opening uh, talk with Michael, and I probably missed something you've said. But I'm, I'm confused, too, because at our, in my district, the ELO grant, we're just beginning it right now. And we've been told that this is a required before and after school that uh, for you have to offer to, I think it's 80% of the kids and that it has to make for a nine and a half hour day. Is that make sense to you guys? It's a that, total of, it's a total of a nine hour day. Nine hours. Okay. Yep. And what it, what it really means is that you have the opportunity to provide before and or after school 
intercession and summer opportunities for students. And okay. it's opportunity, which means that the majority of you are not going to have every young person that is eligible show up for some of these opportunities. You can even be specific about identifying within your unduplicated pupil population, like in, in those numbers, mm -hmm. specific services for specific young people, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the thing that we are hearing about people, well, hearing from folks is they're assuming that the the ask is in totality if that makes any sense that like you have to do all of this you have to do it right now and it has to show up like this for every young person what it's supposed to really say is you have to create a program opportunity that now can meet the needs the varying needs of young people so and i'm going to talk people through something super quickly in the beginning the way that people read even the ACES information, right? The interpretation was programs had to go for X amount of hours every day for a certain amount of hours per week for young people to be counted. Right. That was not necessarily true because there's an actual um, a subset in the ed code that said something about at least half of the time. And so people meant, oh, that means it has to be half of this. That was only in relationship to the before school programmatic hours. But if you had a signed, no, if your district has a documented early release um, policy, yes. that's what families have to follow. So that doesn't mean that if, if a parent said, my child has to leave at four o'clock, because they have a counseling appointment or we live two hours from here and we have to go and that's the only safe way I can get them home, mm -hmm. then they get to go home, right? Mm -hmm. The same kind of flexibility is built into the structure of this program. And I think, Lisa, part of the challenge is people kept hearing it and they were like, we now automatically have to run an, a before school program for all of these young people and an after school program for all of these young people. That's not what it means. For some places, they are really thinking that um, advantageously, right? They're, they're really trying to do a program that big. But what you're gonna find is when you actually talk to your families, you may end up having to provide services daily for a much smaller percentage of young people and then have specialized opportunities for other folks, right? There's some people that are doing things like they have foster care youth who they wanna make sure get a meal after school because that's a priority for those young people. Mm -hmm. So all of those young people are doing snack and then some of them are staying through the supper program. So they are in more of the comprehensive full after school program that goes about three hours a day. And if but you they're- Sure. If they're, if they're in that. Okay. So that's what I'm confused about. So we're putting out our applications for our ACES grants and our 20, 21st century grants. Uh -huh. We're being told, but that's different. Don't include kinder and first, which are, which must be included in the ELO grant because we're going to do that separately. And they're talking about having separate staffing. Are they two different programs? Are we that's, that's not the intent. The intent is that's the same way that we look at your, okay, now remember it used to be called your comprehensive school day is your minimum hour requirements for your school day, right? Do we separate the babies inside of that school day? We don't. Even though some teachers and some support staff may be funded different ways to provide different services, it still looked at one comprehensive school day. What we're asking folks to do for the first time and giving them some flexibility to make this possible and understanding that you are not going to be able to do all of this at one time, right? That what we're asking folks to do is try to build up your program, right? So that you start and I think Oakland has always been a good example. And you know, I say that because I'm from there, but still <laughs> the, one of the things that we did, we've served kinder in our expanded learning programs for years. We've never served TK, right? In some places. 
And so the first thing that some of the programs asked me about was they wanted to start adding TK students. So you know which TK students they added first? Ones that had siblings in the program. Of course. Because it made sense for the families to be able to access that. It also meant they were starting with a smaller number. And so they did, they were able to fund one part-time person to support those TK and K students in a developmentally appropriate way in the classroom and still maintain their one to 10 kind of average, which is now what this new funding allows for. Oh. So there's 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 different ways of looking at this. And what I would suggest, Lisa, um, and sorry, Becca, because we took over the whole talk, is <laughs> there's an office hours workshop um, after this. And I would say, yeah, write down your specific kind of question and then you can go specifically to the office hours because I think it'll help. Okay. Um, yeah, just of course. One, just one generalized question though then. Uh -huh. So the ELO grant is for to be used in after school and before school, I understand that, but it's like melded with our ACES in 21st century. ELO grant is one thing. ELO program is another. So we need to be clear about those two, right? Because your ELO grant has a little bit more flexibility to do kind of some infrastructure building for this new change and to kind of really um, focus on supporting those students that were transitioning back and really struggling, right? And how to help the school put some structure in place to hold them. The ELO program, yes, is specifically to support your before and after school intercession and summer programming. That does not mean that some of those people may not be doing things through the throughout the comprehensive day, but the majority of services and supports they provide will be before, after school, intercession, and summer. Okay. And the way to think about it from here on out, mm -hmm. and Rebecca's gonna get more into this in this session, we ask people for the first time put your funding to the side, prioritize the needs of your young people, look at the services that they need, then identify what's the staffing that's needed to do that, then look at all your funding opportunities and then start trying to put together a comprehensive funding strategy, right? And so that way you'll see that if your ACES covers 80% of your staffing for the existing students that it serves, you would use ELO funding to round out that if you don't have some match and or expand, deepen or deepen that work. So with a lot of places, they realize their ACES programming was already supporting the majority of their unduplicated pupil population. Right. So what they were able to do with this additional funding was to provide more robust and personalized services in the programming. So they were able to offer more explicit tutoring and capacity building in academics. They were able to offer better and more comprehensive enrichment activities. They were able to partner with places to do more enriching field trips and to do more project-based learning, right? So there's different things that that funding can now make the program that you had that was good, mm -hmm. great. Okay. Wonderful. And Akila, thank you for putting that in the chat box. Um, and she had, if I don't know if you wanted to just share, I think there's a regional lead who your regional lead is, as well as more information on the ELLP facts. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, thank, thank you. you. All right. Okay, so I wanted us to hold exactly what Tiffany and Lisa were talking about, right? Tiffany talked about the flexibility of the ELOP and so forth. And the reason why I put this up on the screen was to show you how we can think about all the different things that are very similar in regards to the different funding. So hold that piece. Some of these fundings will support are unduplicated, majority of them will, mental health support, after school funding, right? Not just within expanded learning grants, but also in the educator effectiveness and ESSER. So just kind of hold that work right now. Let's talk about MTSS and the framework. How many of you guys have seen this slide? It is our bicycle slide, right? If you're in the world of MTSS, this is our famous slide. And um, I'm gonna ask one of you to, now we're gonna practice these coaches. So we're gonna <laughs> practice. What is this slide about? What are you seeing on here? 
We have the bicycle. How many of you guys have actually seen or had a uh, bot purchased a bike and then they came out with a box? <laughs> I have. Yeah, I have. I bought a bike on Amazon and um, all it came with was all the parts on the left side. And my kids tried to put it together. And when I rode on it, I felt like it was going to fall apart. So then I brought it to the shop so that they can fix it up, right? So this is what it, this is what MTSS really is. It really is without a framework, you just see all the different pieces, right? And we're thinking about that from this perspective of our school system as well. Without a framework, you're just seeing all the different siloed work, right? But with the framework, and you're putting the bicycle together. As you can see, you have coaching as the handrails, effective interventions as the bicycle, implementation as the, the pedals, right? All the different components that actually drive a system within the school system needs a framework. And multi-tiered systems of supports is that framework, okay? One of the things that we like to share is that when we think about a bicycle, and this goes back to what Brisa said. When we think about a bicycle, when we when we have a flat tire, do we throw the entire bike away? Come on, guys. Do you no. throw the entire bike away? Of course not. Of course not. What do you do when you have a flat tire? You put air in it or you buy a tube. That's called continuous improvement right? We're looking at what are the things that we got to fix and how do we fix it? If my, when I, when my, when I started riding the bike that my children had put together for me, the chair went all the way down and I'm like, okay, I need to figure this out. <laughs> There's something wrong here. And it was a screw that wasn't screwed in, right? I didn't throw the entire bike away, although I wanted to, I kept the bike and I screwed in the, the, the seat a little bit tighter. So we wanna make sure that when we put a framework together, it's not about in education, we want something new. There's always this new shiny star that we wanna bring in. But what happens with that? We call that initiative fatigue. Everyone will be fatigued in regards to everything that we're trying to put in place. Now, when I work with districts, what I say to them is three to five things that we should be working on. Three to five things that we do well and not 20 different things. When we do a resource mapping or initiative mapping, I will tell you, I have some districts that had over a hundred initiatives. How are we gonna do that? Well, we're not, okay? So hold all that y'all. And I know you guys have the same experience and I'm preaching to the choir. So uh, my team and I actually had um, put this kind of slide together to kind of help you Think about MTSS in a more kind of organized way, okay? And we talked about the three components that sticks out for uh, MTSS, which is structure, data, and practices. Under structure, we talk about having an effective team. Why is it important to have an effective team? I'll talk a little bit more about that as we have more conversation. Collaborative and partnership ties to the team. You have to have different stakeholders at the table, not only people that will talk, but people that will actually make decisions, okay? But it's not just about having a team, it's about having an effective and efficient team, okay? Uh, coaching, training, consultation, communication plan, commitment, and coordination all live in the world of the structure for uh, the MTSS framework. And then data. Database decision-making, making sure that our, our initiatives or our programs have fidelity and are making impact. Always having that continuous improvement, progress monitoring. What are we monitoring? I'm not just talking about monitoring impact or outcomes. I'm talking about monitoring process. I'm talking about fidelity. If we say that we're putting a program in place or a certain service or initiative, what does it take to make the impact? And how are we monitoring the fidelity of the program? Okay, uh, problem solving models, making sure that when we're having these meetings and we're looking at data, that it's always around solution focused, right? 
It's not about admiring the problem, which we all do. We sit and we admire the problem. Then we have 10 different meetings that we're talking about the same different thing, same thing, okay? And admiring the same problem. So what are those effective and efficient practices that we have to put in place? And there's a lot of research and there's a lot of different tools that we can provide to you to be able to train up your teams to be able to do this work around problem solving. And like Tiffany said, holding and looking at your data to identify the needs of your students is what's going to drive your plans, not just what people want, but really what is the need of the, the population. And then practices, culturally relevant equity, early access. What does early access mean? Early access means that we're not waiting for a program to be put in, or to have a student get into a program 60 days on. We want to be able, we, we call it the 72 hour rule. Have you guys heard of that? The 72 hour rule means that there has to be a way in which we provide a service to, or at least go through the process to get a student into an intervention. It's a 72 hour rule. You, what happens in special education, right? If we have a student who has behavior issues, what tends to happen? We go straight up to special ed because there's the additional resources. No, it's not gonna work guys. Cause what happens to the kid with the behavior? He's still in school and he's still trying to get services. He's still trying to be in the classroom. So what service do we have to put in place within 72 hours to support that student? And, and, and if we're waiting for any sort of assessment in the long term, right? So that's the 72 hour rule. That's the early access. And then evidence-based practices or evidence informed. Evidence-based practices. Why is it important that we have evidence-based practices, anybody? And in the world of education, that's important. In other worlds, <laughs> we don't really talk about it, which we are trying to. But why is evidence-based practices important? It works. It's been proven to have work. It's called evidence-based for a reason, right? And a lot of times, like our restorative practices or social-emotional learning, there's a lot of research starting to happen. But even in the last couple of years, we call it evidence-informed because they're starting to go through the process of trying to become evidence-based. Um, but it still works, right? There's some pockets of areas that we see happening. All right. Hold up, Rebecca, before you move, because I, I think the other part to remember about what she just said is the reason why the culturally relevant and it's really equity-driven practices are at the top is that that can then be another lens that you use to look at those evidence-based and evidence-informed because a lot of times there are practices that work that don't work for everybody. And so in our structures and systems, we have to ensure that we've taken into consideration maybe what other people didn't have to before we say that, yes, this is the practice or this is the strategy that we wanna use because we've considered our own kind of context and culture of the young people and families that we serve. That's my equity marker, y'all. <laughs> Thanks, Tiff. All right, so let's focus on teams and data. So these are the two specific things that I want us to have conversation around. Teams and data is probably uh, the two components that it really drives us building out a system. And when we talk about ELOP and we talk about all these different plans, I just showed you all the different plans and all the different focus areas. What are those specific things we highlighted, right? Really thinking about that uh, in terms of how do we leverage? All right, we still have folks coming in. All right, so let's focus on teams and data. We're not just talking about teaming structures at the school site level. We're talking about teaming structure at the district level. So Brisa, going back to your question, right? How are we getting to a place where we're speaking that admin language, getting people to buy in is what we're talking about. How do we begin to leverage? You wanna look at, and we talk about symmetry of process. It's called the cascading teaming structure. So if you look at the district level, who are the people at the district level that actually are stakeholders that can make decisions 
but also you want to have people at the who are on the ground level having conversation around what works. Because if our leaders are the only ones making decisions and we're not really identifying exactly what is working and what's not working, how are we going to really build out a comprehensive plan? So what does that look like? And start thinking about in your school districts and in your programs. And so thinking if you have a team in your program, do you actually have decision makers at the top that are actually sitting alongside you? Are you beginning to build those? You guys said many of you are coaches. There's a reason for coaching, right? It's to get you to be really understand the work so that you then can cascade it down and begin to build capacity. You are that, you are that person that is going to every single part of the system, right? Of the organization that is going to share the information. Symmetry of process is cascading down. If you look at the school sites, you're looking at from the district level to the school site teams should also have very similar structures around stakeholders at the table, okay? One set of teams that authority to make decisions. So meaning that if we have a district level team who's making those decisions around connecting the dots, are there silo teams? We have, a, we have a document, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of it, but it's called a working smarter matrix. And the working, and I'll share that with you in the chat box before we leave, but the working smarter matrix actually has you list out all the teams that you have in your district and in your school site and look at the purpose of each of those teams and what it ties to as far as goals. So that you then can really see, are those teams actually should they be put in place or are they still working? Are they not working? Can we collapse some of them so that we can build up? Or do we need a separate team for this? Or can we actually have this one team focus on the ELOP grant or all the other funding sources? So who's sitting at that table with you? Actively uncovering needs of students, families, and staff. What that means is we're looking at data on an ongoing basis. Who would have thought, right? Our teams shouldn't just sit and talk. Our teams should actually be looking at data. That is what NTSS is about. It's we need to know what data sources. Whenever I start, when I started working with expanded learning, one of the things that I asked Fred Bugs, who was our consultant in San Diego, I said, hey, what data, what data um, points do we look at for expanded learning? And he goes, what? Well, we look at attendance. Is that all we look at? We look at attendance. Oh, well, what other, what other data points do we look like? There's a whole lot of data points that we should be looking at at the K-12, in K-12 that will then inform our after school, but also in after school. So what are those data points that you guys have in place, right? Focus on high leverage activities. What are those activities that are going to get the biggest bang for your buck, right? What is the one thing that you can make the biggest impact, but it's the smallest change, right? Biggest impact, but the smallest amount of time you got to work on it, okay? What are those high leverage activities? You're not going to know what those are unless you look at your data, okay? Matching interventions and supports based on type and intensity of needs. So remember those shiny stars that you guys see that everybody wants to capture all the time? Because it's, it's, the, it's the in thing now, right? When social emotional learning came on, when restorative practices came on, I used to tell our districts, do you really need all that? Okay, let's talk about why. And it's fine if you do, but let's tie it to what the data is showing us, right? We want bullying prevention. Well, what is your bullying prevention? What does your bullying data look like? Oh, we don't have any bullying data. Well, then why do you need bullying prevention, right? So those are the things that we need to be able to think about when we're looking at data and how we're tying those things together. Focus on staff, differentiate based on roles. When I say focus on staff, we gotta build capacity, guys. We gotta get folks to a place of understanding and learning how to intervene and learning skill sets so that they then in turn can teach. Let me tell you, working in Ravenswood City School District, what was important to me was that we provided support to our students across the day. We knew that living in East Palo Alto, there were going to be things outside of the schools that were going to get kids to a place that wasn't so great, 
right? Maybe they were going to join gangs or what have you. So I had a lot of kids who had emotional disabilities, challenging behaviors. And the first thing that always happened was after school doesn't want them. No, we don't want behavior kids, not happening. Why? That's where they really need to be in the after school program so they can get enrichment, they could build skills, they could do all that. Well, we don't know how to deal with them. Okay, well, let's teach you. Let's work on those skill sets. Let's work on building, uh, having trainings for our after school program staff members that they can actually support our students with the most behaviors, right? The most challenging needs. So how do we do that? Focusing on building capacity and focusing on our staff. All right, so with all that, that's a lot of information when we talk about MTSS, but I want us to focus on teams and data. So teaming and collaboration. Teaming is a fundamental function of teams is to, a fundamental function of teams is to distribute the workload among multiple individuals and it creates an opportunity to enhance collaboration, okay? So let's sit with this a little bit, guys. I think we're small enough, unless you think, Tiff, we should break out into groups right now. Yeah, uh, I think you can because we've got like 20 some odd folks now. Okay. So think about these questions of who, uh, do you have a team that is building your ELO plan? Who's a part of this team? And is it connected to the, the development of these other plans, okay? So think about what those teams are. And I heard Martha, when you talked about your team, the, the money coming directly to your department. Okay, let's think about the team that you have to create this plan. Are there other folks outside of your department that is coming into your team to help really look at the data and identify what are the needs of our students and how do we leverage K-12 as well, right? So think about that and Miss. Tiff, are you going to be able to push them into breakout? So think about these three questions. Sorry. I'm going to break you out into uh, different groups for a little bit, just to have this conversation in regards yep. to who is on your team when you're developing the ELO plan or thinking about um, your ELO plan. Okay. All right. right, room should be open. All right, folks are coming back. Got a few more seconds. What'd y'all talk about? Martha has a great idea. <laughs> or okay, Martha, what's your great idea? Sure, um, so we're using part of our ELOP funds to pay for a behavior specialist specifically for after school programs. Um, this is a position we actually had um, pre-pandemic for about two years, but then because of the pandemic, we had to eliminate the position, um, but that was under different leadership. So this is my first time that I'll be overseeing a behavior specialist in our department. Um, but yeah, we're gonna build on best practices and we have a really robust special education program that will be supporting me and supporting this new behavior specialist for our department. I think that's awesome. It's, um, you know, it's been really interesting for a lot of folks, um, the thing, uh, Rebecca's Wi-Fi kicked her off, y'all, so she's going to be coming back in. <laughs> Tech is just doing what it wants to today. Um, the, I was asking kind of what, what you all talked about, and Martha was sharing that they're going to have a behavior specialist now in their expanded learning time. So that's a great use of funding. It's, it's really interesting how some people haven't, I think there's two ways to approach, right, this this framing for this work. If you have existing state and federally funded programs, you start with what they already did well, right? And you grow those programs. If you don't, then where you start is, what's your LCFF data telling you about the communities that you're supposed to serve? And then one of the things that we clearly identified is, folks needed someone at the district level who could hold this work. and challenges that we saw or that we're still seeing is that, and sometimes they're hiring people that have no expanded learning experience, which can be challenging because they don't necessarily understand the complexity of expanded learning versus how our comprehensive day structures are. Expanded learning is anchored in and framed through youth development. 
It is the way of addressing the needs through non-traditional measures that can really support young people in ways that aren't necessarily given that kind of space and the comprehensive day. So things like bringing in counselors and bringing in behavioral specialists. We have some folks that are bringing in more focus to uh, more people to focus on like family and parent engagement. So there's more connection with families to the school day, right? Like lots of different ways that people are looking at taking this funding and and doing some different kind of work with it. Um, Rebecca, you you back? I thought I saw her. I am too, but you're <laughs> going to have to hold the slide. I'm sorry, and we might just need a that we have uh, about six more minutes. So yeah, sorry, my, my computer totally comes out on me, so. No worries, so yeah, we're just, um, I was asking folks, what did they talk about? So anybody else, what did y'all talk about in your groups? Can I volunteer, Dennis? Oh, it looks like you're on mute. <laughs> I, you know, oh, go ahead. I, I just I talked to we, both uh, the person in my group and uh, uh, and myself. We kind of at opposite end of the spectrums. One person had not dumped on her, but it, she was kind of working by herself because everyone is not helping or supporting. She's still trying to build that team right now and identify who some of those key people are. And on my end, we had we started back since September meeting with a core group, and and now it's turned into uh, I call it a shakeup of how to shake up everything Ooh. because our district has realized how much money it is now from the perspective of, and by the way, I understand that word expanded. They're looking at it from how do I take this money and extend and fill in gaps and backfill for the district on things that they have not been able to previously do. So there's an expanded way of doing things, which is build the stakeholder group, involve the stakeholders from the beginning, use the data, be data driven, um, yeah. figure out how to work with systems that we already have, what needs to go to the side, what can we innovate. They're saying nice aces, beautiful, great, all that, but we already have a plan. And that's what I wanted to bring up, Tiffany. What they're using now, or what I noticed, at least within the district context is, we do have the LCAP plan and we have that and that's already there. So we don't really need your data. We don't really need, we have our own LCAP stakeholder data. They, sim, they serve similar students, right? Unduplicated students. And um, so thank you for that little expanded day speech you gave about uh, meeting kids' needs or young people's needs being used development driven and rooted in that we're all that we're all that but we also would like mm -hmm. to add some more TOSAs some alerts some specialists here and their version of this is different and I get why because this is the natural operation of our district and there has been this um so there's kind of like a culture shift yeah they're telling me you have to have a paradigm shift I'm saying no you need the paradigm shift you need brain surgery <laughs> You need a heart shift. You need a heart shift. So oh, I get the important people need to be in the room, but I just want to focus on a lot of times this excludes expanded day learning people because yeah. my strength is not the LCAP. I yeah. am aware of the LCAP. I've participated in it. I've educated myself over the years trying to get a part of the LCAP plan. <laughs> and now, ironically, they're, they're, they've excluded me out of LCAP. And now, ironically, this is the point where we're at. I would like to just say it probably needs to be a balance of who's at that table. Yeah. Because if the district drives that by themselves, they will naturally eliminate those people who talk about youth development. Not because it's not important, but it's definitely not priority when it comes to a district. All of that, they just hope happens, not intentionally. They so build then, their staff and admin around. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. And Dennis, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question then. Um, as you said, you have familiarized yourself with the LCAP. Have you been thinking about the ELO program and the planning around how do you tie to the LCAP? Because I think I it goes back to, right? It goes back to, yes, we have to educate our leaders. Yes, that's the hope in regards to us making a shift. And some of the folks that sit at the leadership top, right? 
have to get to a place where we then begin to have that conversation. But right now, as you're developing that ELO program, how are you making the connection to that so that when you are speaking to the higher ups, you're, you're building that language for them? This is what Absolutely. I'm seeing. This is that, how after school program is interconnecting. Absolutely. And I've done this over a number of years. I'll just say it this way. The LCAP by design is built from an instructional day point of view, which it should be. It has a lot of instructional day goals linked to our district goals. And our program is linked to our district goals. How we go about fulfilling those goals looks different though. So if, if you look at a, like think of a pyramid, our LCAP, in our LCAP plan, our, AL, our expanded day learning program is in there. We're at the bottom though. So what, how they explain it is, these are the most effective strategies effective strategies, um, uh, the, the, they have like a, a way of, of, of explaining and they have us down as effective strategies. They're not saying we're not effective, but they're saying uh, most more effective is in the middle of the pyramid and most effective is at the top. Well, when we talk language and trying to share language, what do you think is most effective? Elerts, uh, mortosas, uh, uh, and so at the bottom of that pyramid, they have us, which is you're effective. We're not saying, so when we come to this money and trying to use their language, it's, I, I think a lot of it is also helping them understand kind of what Michael Funk was saying in the beginning of the opening session. Let's not look at to what always you've gone to, but let's look at to what's possible. And in order to do that, you have to eliminate fear of rules, how you can't do this. And so I am using that, e, that the LCAP program, and I don't know if that is everyone else going through that process is, of involving others. We're using the LCAP pro process, but I don't want to be limited to only LCAP because well, it's not this the is, only that. This is the challenge, you guys. And this this is, and for those of, that don't know, Dennis is, uh, he is really trying to fight the good fight to hold the integrity of the work that he's been doing for a really long time, right? And one of the things that we are seeing, and I know it's 1130, so I'm going to be really quick so that I can pass it back to Rebecca, is the, the challenge for expanded learning programs is getting, um, it's not so much about getting a seat at the table, because most of the time we haven't had a seat at the table, but it's also once you get a seat at the table, feeling welcomed and appreciated at the table. Right. Yeah. So a lot of times, and this is the part of the, the, the work that we're trying to have conversations with superintendents about is people did not understand the value of expanded learning programs for a really long time. During the height of the pandemic, they saw what our programs do. They saw what it meant to be really connected to communities, to families, to really see young people and to frame and focus through what they need versus what the system is saying they should get at this moment, right? And so part of what we are saying to everybody now is like, this is why I think the LCAP conversation is important. And there's some stuff that I was putting in the chat, Rebecca and I talking was real important things also anchor in, we've only been looking at certain data when it came to how we measured what success looked like. And the truth is, if it all really worked, would we really have the unduplicated pupil population numbers that we did, that we do? We wouldn't because the work would actually be serving those young people that are the most in need. And the fact that we also have strategies that we've never been able to fully recognize. I think for the most part, I've been in expanded learning for almost 20 years. And in truth, you know, when it was actually fully funded, when it first started off, when people didn't know what to do with it. And so we had 21st century dollars. And at one specific program, I had over $400,000 in expanded learning dollars going into our programs. That was a combination of Healthy Start. It was a combination of, of 21st century and ACES dollars and before and after school learning. So different funding streams, but I had full-time clinicians at programs in the middle of East Oakland. We had, you know what I mean? We had all of these resources because what we realized is we needed to play the bridge between the school and the community and expanded learning really did that. And so when we're having these discussions in your own communities, it really is going to be about sometimes educating a group and a population of folks who think that there's only one way to educate young people. And we know that that's not true. Um, Rebecca, cause y'all we are so over, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, I, my computer, yeah. Uh, was not good. Anyways, um, 
I wish we had more time, y'all. I think MTSS is a, a, a big conversation. I only pick two components that I think are very, very important. Um, and maybe we, I hope that we could probably continue the conversation moving forward. Uh, but like Tiffany said, it really is about what teams are we bringing together and really looking at your data to drive those needs, right? What is it that we're looking at in terms of uh, the data points that you're collecting? And then from there, uh, ensuring that you're, you're basing the plan off of that. Um, if you need my, if you need to talk or, or have any questions or anything like that, um, I will, or maybe Tiff will put my information in the chat box, um, or I think it'll be sent out um, and in hopes that we will have a continued conversation moving forward. All right. Thanks, y'all. So you guys will make um, Rebecca's slide deck that has other notes in it. We'll make the resources that she referenced. All of that will be available in the app as well as her contact information because right now she's also currently supporting some schools. So she's able to answer some questions kind of by email real time. So thank you all seriously for, for everything that you do and for continuing to fight for the babies that aren't always seen in our systems. Y'all go have lunch now, for real. Don't look at the screens. <laughs> Are you going to share the slides or? Yeah, well, they're gonna be in the app, Akila. Thank you, bye. So of course, all right, bye-bye.